Hi, uh, my name is uh, Ron Pressler and I'm the technical lead for Project Bloom. Project Bloom's primary goal is to make it easier to write high throughput concurrent applications like servers. But I assume that by now, most of you have heard of it and at least know its main elements. If not, there are quite a few introductory talks you can find online. So what I want to do today is focus on certain areas and certain questions that come up over and over. I or someone else from the project are now online answering questions through Zoom's Q&A feature, so feel free to ask questions at any time. The first thing, perhaps the most important thing to understand about Loom, is why it exists and how exactly it helps. I said that Loom aims to make it easier to write high throughput concurrent applications like servers, so first let's see what we mean by concurrency. Oftentimes, concurrency is confused with par parallelism, and the distinction between the two is crucial to understanding Loom because it seeks to help with one, concurrency, while other job features help with parallelism. The definitions of parallelism and concurrency I'm using are in line with the computer science teaching guidelines of the ACM. Parallelism is the problem of speeding up the execution of a single task by splitting it into multiple pieces that are then worked on uh, by cooperating some tasks running on different processing units. In Java, the main feature that addresses parallelism is parallel streams. Or if you want to go lower than that, uh, then split rater, which as its name suggests, splits up work, and the fork join pool. Project Loom, on the other hand, addresses concurrency, which is the problem of scheduling many mostly independent tasks that compete over resources. A prime example of that is a server that needs to serve many requests that arrive at a fast rate. And because handling each request takes up a bit of time, they end up concurrently competing over the server's resources. The metric we wish to optimize when concurrency is concerned is throughput, or how many transactions we can serve per second. Because the more transactions we can serve in one machine, the fewer machines we need. The throughput, transactions per second, in a system that serves requests concurrently is governed by this formula called Little's Law. It says that if the system is stable, meaning requests don't pile up in an ever-growing queue, the level of concurrency, or the number of transactions we'll be serving concurrently, is equal to the rate at which requests arrive, which is the same as the rate at which they're completed, uh, or our throughput, or else the system won't be stable, times the latency, which is the average duration it takes to serve a single request. For example, if requests arrive at an average rate of 1,000 per second, uh, and so we must complete them at the same rate for the server to be stable. And each transaction takes 10 milliseconds, or one one hundredth of a second, then our level of concurrency, or the average number of transactions we'll have to be handling at any one time, is 10. Now, I've called W the total latency because there's a nuance here uh, worth paying attention to. Suppose that to serve a request, our server needs to contact two services over the network each responding within five milliseconds. If those services are independent, instead of calling them one at a time, taking 10 milliseconds in total, we call them in parallel. We've reduced the latency by a factor of two, uh, um, but uh, because we want to do those operations concurrently, we've also multiplied our level of concurrency by two, and the two cancel each other out. So W is the overall latency of serving a request as if it were done sequentially. So in this case, it will still be considered 10 milliseconds rather than five. For the system to be stable, again, the throughput must equal the rate of request arrival lambda. Now, lambda is a requirement of the system. To meet the requirements, we can either reduce W or increase L. Now, W, the total latency, is also usually a constant for any given system, as it depends on how much work we need to do the speed of our database, et cetera. So we don't have that much control over it. The variable we can uh, control is L, more easily control, our level of concurrency, 
or the number of transactions the system can process at any given time. We can increase it by buying more machines, but that costs money. Uh, we'd like to buy as few machines as possible, so we'd like the level of concurrency for any single server to be high. What factors affect L on a single server? There are hardware limitations like RAM and processing calls and network card bandwidth, but there are also software infrastructure limitations that might cause us to make inefficient use of the available hardware, reducing the level of concurrency. If we process a request start to finish on a single thread, or maybe even split it into multiple threads, then it will hang on to at least one thread for its entire duration. This means that the number of threads we'll require will be at least L. This is true even if we pull the threads and reuse them once the transaction is finished. But the transaction is not using the CPU or even the network for that entire duration. Much of the time, it's just waiting for other services, the database, etc. Unfortunately, the number of active threads the operating system can effectively provide us with is relatively low, say a few thousand. Why? Well, the reasons aren't complex, but generally speaking, it's because the OS is very general and must work for many different languages at one time without knowing the details of how they use thread resources. And it must work for many different kinds of workloads, from serving transactions to encoding video, without knowing the specific details of the application. And so this generality means that the OS, uh, that OS threads do not make optimal use of available hardware and can support fewer units of concurrency frames than the hardware can, making threads a rather limited resource. So we're holding on to a precious software resource for the entire duration of the transaction, and that's wasteful. We might need to buy more servers just because threads are costly, even if most of what they do is wait. Now, what some people do is make more efficient use of hardware and buy fewer machines, uh, to, 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 to buy fewer machines, is not to hang on to a thread for the entire duration of a transaction. Instead, using a thread only when the transaction actually needs to do some processing and returning the thread to the pool while the transaction waits for another service. To do that, they need to use specialized non-blocking APIs that release the thread while an IO operation is in progress. This requires a very different style of programming called the asynchronous style. And there are APIs in the JDK, like Completable Future or Flow, that support it, as well as many different third-party libraries employing something called reactive streams. What this style effectively does is separate the application's logical unit of concurrency, the transaction, from the ordinary software uh, uh, unit of concurrency, the thread. This means that the number of threads we need is no longer L, and we're only limited by the hardware rather than by the cost implementation of those threads. But this is a big problem. Because the entire Java platform, the APIs, the runtime, the tooling is built around the thread construct. Even if we could write asynchronous code in a way that looks more or less reasonable, there is much more to software than how its source code looks on the screen. So of course we have thread locals that associate some data with an execution context by attaching it to the thread. But we also have exception backtraces that were diagnostics give us the context of the error in the form of a thread stack trace. We have debuggers that we use to step through an execution context by stepping through a thread. And when we profile our application with JFR and examining it in JMC, the data is grouped by threads. And when we want to know what our program is currently doing, we obtain a thread dump. By separating the lo logical unit of concurrency, the one we care about for context, namely that transaction, from the unit of concurrency of the platform, the thread, we miss out on all the context the platform can give us. We lose diagnosability and debuggability and observability and profileability, the things we in the Java platform group call serviceability, which is one of the platform's biggest focus points and one of Java's greatest strengths. Not to mention that asynchronous code and uh, synchronous code don't interoperate well. Our server will need to be all asynchronous and we'll be fighting against the design of the platform 
with which associates context with threads rather than working with it. And if that is a price we have to pay to increase our level of concurrency, then that's a very high price. The money we save on hardware, we spend on more costly development and maintenance. And that is where Project Bloom comes in. The idea is simple. If the problem is the high cost of threads, rather than abandoning the thread as a unit, as the unit to represent a transaction, let's make it cheaper by implementing it more efficiently in the platform rather than rely on the cost implementation in the OS. Project Loom adds something we've decided to call virtual threads because like virtual memory, they give the illusion of a plentiful resource by automatically and cleverly mapping it onto a more precious uh, physical resource. Virtual threads behave just like today's Java threads. In fact, they even use the same class, Java Lang thread. But instead of Java Lang thread serving as a wrapper around an OS thread, if we choose to make a thread virtual at thread construction time, and we can do it individually, it will be implemented by the Java platform much more efficiently than the OS. So instead of just a few thousand threads, our application can employ tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of threads and make much more efficient use of the available hardware when used for several applications of the kind I described. And because virtual threads are threads, at least as far as Java is concerned, they're harmonious with the design of the platform. But how is this possible? Because unlike the OS, the Java runtime knows exactly how it uses thread resources like the call stack, and so it can make much more efficient use of RAM. It also knows that if you're using virtual threads, then you're interested in a high level of concurrency when serving transactions. And, and so it can employ a scheduling algorithm that is more appropriate for that use case. Okay, so how do we use virtual threads? Well, the same way we use today's threads. We let our code run in them. Then, if needed, we inspect their stack traces and exceptions and thread types. Uh, we step through them in the debugger and we profile them with JFR. Because there isn't really any other way to use threads and because your code will use virtual threads just as it uses platform threads. That's what we call those that just wrap an OS thread. You already know how to use them. And that's why there's no need to show you any code here. But how do we create virtual threads? Well, there's a new uh, builder API to create uh, threads where you can choose if you want a virtual thread or a platform thread. Uh, but just as today, most of us don't construct threads directly using a new Java Lang thread, uh, we don't expect uh, you'll be constructing virtual threads directly either. Rather, you'll be using the same APIs you use today, like executor service or uh, APIs very similar to it that will create uh, virtual threads as needed. Just note that while the API is the same or similar, under the covers, things are a little different. Most of the time today, when we use an executor service, it wraps a pool of threads that are reused by multiple tasks we submit to the service. Why is there a need for the pool? Because platform threads are precious. So like any scarce resource, we pool them. Virtual threads, on the other hand, aren't cheap and plentiful. So pooling them is counterproductive and misses the point. We never pool virtual threads. Instead, the appropriate execute service will spawn a new virtual thread for each task submitted to it. This is not only nicer, but also safer, as we don't risk potentially sensitive thread locals leaking from one thread, uh, from one task to another. Now, some people also use thread pools, not just to reuse precious threads, but also to intentionally limit the concurrent access to some limited resources. If, for example, uh, their database can handle only 100 concurrent transactions, they'll have a thread pool size 100 and submit all DB tasks to that pool. How do we best do that with virtual threads, given that I said we must never pool them? Well, we use a construct designed especially for that purpose, limiting concurrency, namely the semaphore. Initialize the semaphore to 100 and acquire and release it in any method that needs to access the limited resource. If I, a thread calls that method, it might have to block and wait until more instances are available, but blocking is cheap when threads are virtual. Uh, you can even guard your entire server with the semaphore. So that after a certain number of concurrent connections, it stops accepting new ones, passing back pressure uh, to the client. Uh, 
What if, in the course of serving a request, you need to contact 20 microservices and you want to do it in parallel? Easy, just spawn 20 more threads. You already know how to use virtual threads with all the basic concurrency constructs we learned back in kindergarten. We just have to unlearn some habits that we've picked up over the years that have prevented us from using the simpler concurrency constructs precisely because threads were precious. Of course, your hardware has a finite capacity and at some point will run out of room even for virtual threads, but this is no different from any other Java object like say strings. Another question people ask is, um, how do we know if we need virtual threads or platform threads? So first, let me remind you again that Project Loom is about helping concurrent applications, programs that respond to external events with uh, largely independent tasks, uh, and uh, servers are the canonical example. Uh, if you have some processing heavy batch workloads, then it's likely that your problem is that of parallelism, not concurrency, and for that, we have parallel streams. But the stakes for choosing between the two implementations, virtual or platform, uh, are low because they have the same API. It's not like choosing between synchronous and asynchronous code. You can try one and then the other. Uh, in reality, however, this question is rarely relevant. In most cases, where virtual threads are most helpful, platform threads are simply not an option. You need to do more than say 5,000 or 10,000 things concurrently, then virtual threads are pretty much your only option. Uh, you need to do less than say 1,000 things, it's likely that both choices would perform roughly the same in that case. So usually the choice is either trivial or unimportant. And in the few cases it might matter, the stakes are low and it's easy to switch from one to the other. That's all about virtual threads. Now, how did we do it? We added a cool capability into the OpenJDK virtual machine that allows us to suspend and resume computations. That is, um, the basic, most, perhaps most important ability that threads have. Suspending computation, maintaining its state, and later on resuming it. Uh, and then in the core libraries, we mixed it with Shangela's written in Java uh, to implement virtual threads. But that was just the beginning. We've changed everywhere in the JDK where we interact with threads, uh, when we block for IO or for some concurrency constructs like blocks or blocking queues, so that if the code is called on a platform thread, we'd emit a syscall as we do today to ask the OS to suspend the thread. But if the method is running on a virtual thread, we use the Java runtime mechanism for suspending those. But much, if not most of the work has gone, and in fact still going, into serviceability. The JVM tooling interface and debugger protocol used by debuggers to interact with the runtime had to be changed to ensure uh, tools see virtual threads the same way they see platform threads. And likewise, we changed a JFR or uh, JDK flight recorder, uh, OpenJDK's built-in profiler to do the same. We like uh, uh, saying that Project Loom uh, is like uh, jacking up a house, replacing its foundation, and then gently laying it back down with little or no change to the house itself. So in terms of programmer experience and APIs, very little has changed. Now, some people say, we've been told working with threads in general is bad. Isn't more threads more bad? Well, for one, some of the problems of working with threads are just scale agnostic. You have to exercise the, the exact same amount of caution when concurrently accessing a shared resource, whether you have two threads or two million. The code is no simpler or, or more difficult. Other problems become easier when we can afford a brand new thread for each task, like making sure that thread locals don't leak. But in general, things are just slightly different when their form factor changes, or more than slightly. Uh, using a smartphone doesn't cause the same issues as using a mainframe, even though it's just a miniature computer. When things are smaller and cheaper, their operation tends to be more focused. For example, I said that uh, if you run each transaction in its own thread and then need to emit calls to 20 microservices concurrently, just spawn 20 more threads. But those threads do nothing other than run a single HTTP request. If they fail, the stack trace will not provide much context. We need to make it easier to weave threads into context and to observe them. 
A few years ago, we came across two blog posts by Nathaniel J. Smith on something called structured concurrency, uh, a term that had been coined by Martin Sustry. Those two blog posts, I have to say, were among the very few cases in my career when I read something by an unfamiliar author and was immediately convinced that that's the right way to do things. And I have to urge all of you uh, to read them. The idea of structured concurrency is simple. Whenever execution splits into multiple concurrent threads, it must rejoin in the same code block. Namely, a method doesn't just spawn a thread, return and forget about it, and let the thread run indefinitely. Or in other words, parent threads wait for the children. This does not only make waving many small threads together clearer and easier, it makes noticing and propagating exceptions, normally a big problem with threads, much easier because our thread cannot crash without its parents noticing when it joins it. But it also solves the uh, observability problem. Threads work on behalf of their parents who wait for them. So when we dump thread stacks, we don't just dump a million stack traces, but can place each one in the context of its parents in a way that, that forms a tree. In Loom, we've decided to adopt structured concurrency, at least optionally, we won't be forced to use it, uh, and not only the form of a user-facing API, but also in a way that's reflected in the platform's tooling. So if there is one new thing in terms of actual coding that's new to Loom, it is this. Unfortunately, I cannot show you any code because the user-facing API for structured concurrency is still very much in flux, but I expect we will have many more talks on the subject in the future. Today, you can head on to jdk.java.net slash loom and download an early access JDK with Project Loom so you can give it a try and report your experience to the Loom Dev mailing list. Obviously, don't make any business decisions based on anything I've told you. 